Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Francesco Caselli. I'm pleased to welcome you to this year's Philips Lecture and to introduce our speaker, Professor Thomas Sargent. The Philips Lecture is named, of course, after the author of one of the most influential papers ever published in Economica, which sponsors tonight's event together with the LSE's Economics Department. In keeping with the immense importance of this paper for subsequent work in macroeconomics, the lecture is given every other year by a macroeconomist of the highest standing. Tonight's speaker, Tom Sargent, is one of the towering figures of modern macroeconomics. Together with Robert Lucas, who gave the inaugural Phillips Lecture two years ago, he has been a leader of the Rational Expectations Revolution. His insights on the roles and limits of fiscal and monetary policy, as well as their interlinkages, so controversial at the time of their first appearance, are now an essential component of the body of knowledge imparted to first-year PhD students in economics all over the world. His work to embed time series econometrics in macroeconomic models has shaped the ideas and the methods of generations of macroeconomists. His contributions on learning and optimal control have spawned important, highly vibrant literatures. An introduction for Tom Sargent would not be complete without a mention of his extraordinary record as a mentor for students and young colleagues. I have not had the privilege of studying under Tom, but I have always been deeply struck by the reverence, gratitude, and fierce loyalty of his former students uh, towards him. And this is not a small group. Let me show you what I mean. This is a flower with uh, Tom Sargent in the middle and three concentric circles, the first of which is his immediate students, the second one is the students of his students, and then the third one, this ongoing addition to the students of the students of his students. Uh, so clearly the quantity is as impressive as the quality. Each paper by Tom Sargent attracts much attention and elicit, elicit copious new work by others. I have no doubt that the same will be proved true for tonight's lecture. Tom Sargent. So, what do I do here? <laughs> okay, great. Then does this thing work? Great. Yeah, this works, this works. Okay, I know how to do that, I know how to do that. Sorry for this delay. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna do a little, do little macroeconomics. I hope there's some um, graduate students here because I'm gonna use some models. But I'm not gonna use any equations because um, um, Francesco t advised me uh, a little bit not to use equations, so I'm going to talk about them. Okay, <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about is um, where to draw the lines. Um, so my talk's going to be about wise and timely things that I believe uh, macroeconomic theory has and has had to say about where to draw the lines between first uh, markets for money and markets for credit. And second, monetary and fiscal policies. Um, I'm an American. Historically, it's been um, difficult for American statesmen to agree how to draw those lines, as you might have noticed. I think macroeconomic theory helps explain why statesmen have had so much trouble by shedding light on the tensions and trade-offs involved in drawing those lines, and that's going to be the theme of my talk. The issues are sufficiently um, difficult that the most brilliant economic minds um, have swerved or been tempted to swerve from one extreme position to the other. And I'm going to use Milton Friedman as an example. And furthermore, in drawing the first set of lines, um, as we know today, it inevitably influenced how a government draws the second set of lines. Um, so for sure there are ambiguities and uncertainties about the path forward, but that is because the choices are difficult 
and involve conflicts of interest. Um, by characterizing how um, alternative choices can affect aggregate risk and how that risk is allocated among different citizens and foreigners, macroeconomic theory lights a candle. That's going to be my talk. So those are the lines I want to talk about. So I'm going to show you some high-tech graphs. I did myself. So, th so, th so th this is the whole talk. So um, there's a big line in the middle. On the left are credit markets, and on the right are money markets. And there's a bunch of guys who wanted to draw a big line between that historically and do now. There were the mercantilists. There were the Chicago uh, banking plan, 100% reserves of the 30s, so-called narrow banking. There was Peel's Bank Act in Britain, uh, Bank Act of 1844. There was Paul Volcker in 2010. There's a Glass-Steagall Act in the 30s in the United States. And all of these, all of these people are motivated by um, achieving stability at the cost of introducing rate of return wedges, um, what Milton Friedman called inefficiencies, quote, inf inefficiencies and incentives for, invo for avoidance. So there's going to be a bunch of people who want to draw the line. Um, and when I say mercantilist, uh, some people would hiss. So then there's going to be some people on the other line uh, who, are, who want to remove those lines. Um, so, the, so those people um, want efficiency at possible costs in terms of volatilities and rates of return. So among those people, um, Adam Smith in 1776, in the parts of the uh, wealth of nations that uh, uh, various people at Chicago do did not like or do not like. There's Gary Becker in 1956, who basically advocates a, um, he advocates free banking. I'll talk about that. Um, there's Walter Badgett, not in the recommendations that you remember in, in uh, 1873, but what he thought was the best or optimal system was a system with no lender of last resort. And it was many small banks with no banks big. And banks, um, he thought there wouldn't be panics if you had small banks each on their own and what he called the preservative apprehension. Their depositors would, would watch out for them. He said that was the best system, but it's, it's not the system England had, and it's not the system you would get to, so he wasn't going to talk about it. And he has a line where he, uh, he uh, says disparaging things about mechanism design and positive things about evolutionary economics. And then, over on the far right, there's Milton Friedman, or is it the far left? There's Milton Friedman in 1960, who uh, amends the Chicago plan of banking reform so totally um, that maybe he uh, totally changed it. So, th so lines, no lines. Good idea, bad idea? <coughs> That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, another, some more lines, Tri um, um, which are becoming the, the line between the Treasury and the central bank. It's a fiction. It's mathematically a fiction, but is it a useful fiction? Should there be a lender of last resort? Should be there to be deposit insurance? And what's the line among these three things? And what do we mean by central bank independence? That's about lines. So that's my theme. Okay. So um, well, I'm going to motivate this by some historical examples. I got a bunch in my paper, and I got carried away with it. So uh, American politicians, since before the beginning of the republic, have been concerned about drawing lines or removing them. That, after all, is what our revolution was about. So the, the Constitution um, has, uh, has uh, clauses in it that tie can Congress's hands to prevent it from issuing a paper money. Um, they prevented it from issuing legal tender, uh, paper legal tender. Um, the, the Republic began um, with a massive bailout of state government, bad state government debts, Hamilton's assumption. We've had a perennial question of uh, should there be a central bank and what should a central bank do? Um, and I just want to give you a few little examples from our history of, uh, of how these have been, on all of these issues, there's been close calls, changing majorities, and changing changed minds. For legal tender, there's no question that the, uh, um, that the Constitution rules out uh, legal tender. 
Uh, there was a man named Chase who was President Lincoln's Secretary of Treasury during the Civil War. Before the Civil War, he thought uh, the government uh, could, should not and could not issue uh, legal tender notes. When he was Secretary of Treasury, he said it could and should and did. Then later he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and he declared unconstitutional what he had done as Secretary of Treasury. So he changed his mind. Um, some of your great-great-grandfathers may have uh, hard feelings about this, uh, this next one, federal bailouts of state governments. The Republic began with a massive bailout. The federal government uh, assumed this, the bad state debts that had been issued to um, fight you in our revolution. Um, so we bailed them out massively. Uh, and Hamilton's, reason, Hamilton's reasons are complex, and they are about drawing lines between the state and federal government. And then so what happened in the, in the 19, uh, when you bail somebody out, um, that affects behavior. Fast forward, 1830s, uh, state banks issued, uh, state governments issued large amounts of debts. Um, they went under. This time, the federal government said, uh, forget it. So as a result of that, uh, there were no bailouts then. So we changed our mind. A couple of others. Should there be a central bank? Uh, just get the tone of this. Uh, so here's what we did. In 1791, we said yes as a country. In 1811, we said no. In 1816, we said yes. In 1832, we said no. In 1913, we said yes. Uh, but what do you mean by a central bank? Um, in honor of Andrew Jackson, who killed the central bank in 1832, uh, we said we'll have 12. So we won't have one, we'll have 12. And that's what we have in the United States. Uh, so the country changed, it, it's mine, but so did individuals. James Madison, one of our founders, said no in 1791. He said yes in 1811. He said please yes uh, three weeks after you burned the White House and the rest of Washington. <laughs> and he said yes in 1832. Henry Clay, one of our great statesmen, said no in 1811, and he said yes in 1832. So we've changed our mind a few times. Um, what should a central bank do if we have one? Um, well, we've changed our mind there. And I'll introduce my theme here. Uh, in the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, it was, the Federal Reserve was instructed to purchase real bills. I'll tell you what that means. That's a phrase borrowed from Adam Smith. Um, so we're supposed to purchase real bills in 1913. In 1935, we were told we changed our mind, said don't touch the stuff. And then in 2008, we said uh, buy uh, real bills big time and uh, redefine what you mean by a real bill. So that's going to be my, so we've changed our mind. So um, it's easy to make fun of these politicians, but I'm going to take this, the stance that um, they can't do better than we can as uh, economic theorists. So I'm going to tell you about some uh, models that I believe uh, inform, um, inform these things. That's where I'm going. So that's my theme. Maybe these are, are, are close calls. And they're close calls today for, um, for my country and your country and uh, for, for the world. So I'm going to organize these around a device. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to, if you forgive me, I'm going to narrow the mind, but I'm going to sharpen the mind by narrowing it. So I'm going to talk in, in, in terms of some particular models. Um, so I'm going to organize this, the main part of my talk about uh, a, a long-standing debate between the quantity theory of money versus the real bills doctrine. That has other names. Regulation versus free banking, or price level stability versus efficiency. So that's one set of ideas. And the, the second thing, which, which I'm going to argue is closely related through a little stretch, is uh, lender of last resort and deposit insurance. Is it good or bad? It's going to be what should a central bank do? So you could put this really simply. Um, this is going to be old time, old time and new time monetary theory. The question is, what kind of assets should financial intermediaries be permitted to hold? And what kind of liabilities should they issue? That's the question. It's a question that's as old as the hills, and it is the question today. And I believe it should have been the question that President Obama focused on from the beginning. 
And so did Paul, Paul, that's what Paul Volcker believes. Or another way to say it is where should you draw the line between money and credit markets? I have a need for some liquidity. So some of you, if you're a graduate student, you know about complete markets models and incomplete markets models. The key thing about complete markets models is they're beautiful because there's no wedges. Everybody's marginal rate of substitution in every direction is the same. In incomplete markets models, there's wedges in some directions. Come back to that. So the so what I'm going to claim is for 300 years, um, the names of the liabilities have changed. I'll give you a bunch of names. 18th century, banknotes and bills of exchange. 19th and 20th century, banknotes and deposits. Read for Friedman Schwartz. They're obsessed with it. 21st century, claims on money market mutual funds, maybe even credit default derivatives. And in my country, insurance contracts written by AIG. So the liabilities, the names of the liabilities may have changed, the names of the assets may have changed. Self-liquidating commercial loans in the 18th and 19th centuries. Sovereign debt in the 20th. Mortgage-backed securities in the 21st. I really don't care about, about the names. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna call them assets and liabilities. They might have changed, but I'm gonna argue that underlying theoretical issues endure. George Stigler said that a war can ravage half a continent and raise no new issues in economic theory. So uh, Milton, Milton Freeman is going to be, um, I'm just going to use him as an example. I could use others, like Tobin. Um, so, so, Friedman's, so, so this is a great quote. What Friedman says is, uh, we take it for granted that the government uh, should intervene um, in the money market. But he says um, it's really important to understand what the reasons are for uh, intervening. And he, he says um, government intervention, quote, en en enhances the danger that the scope of government intervention will spread from activities that are to those that are not appropriate in a free society, from providing a monetary framework to determining the allocation of resources among individuals. Um, you should look at the um, Federal Reserve balance sheet in my country. You, Google H41 uh, and look at what the Federal Reserve owns now and think about Friedman's uh, quote. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about efficiency versus stability now. Um, I'm going to talk about Adam Smith and the Reels Bills Doctrine. I'm going to explain to you what it is, tell you a little bit about Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations, why he did it, why I regard the Wealth of Nations as a book about monetary economics. About at least a quarter of it is about monetary economics. And it's not an aside. Um, and then I'll tell you about narrow banking, which is a, a Chicago assault on, um, on Adam Smith. And I'll tell you what, what the tension is between there. So that's what I'm going to try to convey. So, so here's how I read Adam Smith. Um, why does he write about money? He's, he's interested in attacking a, a set of um, po government policies called mercantilism. Um, and um, what they are is they're, they're a device, they're a set of, of, of interventions in, in uh, foreign trade and foreign exchange markets that are designed to, and this is Smith's char characterization, they're designed to protect domestic monetary arrangements. Um, in those days, you're on specie, uh, your domestic money is specie, and if specie is flowing in and, in and out, it, uh, it, it induces um, disturbances in the price level in the domestic monetary arrangements. So what, what, what Smith's characterization of those devices is they're a bunch of, uh, of restrictions um, that are designed to foster precautionary savings, um, get you to accumulate big stocks of gold and silver so that you're isolated from these foreign and domestic shocks to the demand, to, uh, to the demand for, for money. And Smith's criticism is um, it's an inefficiency. He says that oversaving is, is inefficient, just like it is in, um, like in a Bewley model, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, there's too much saving. And Smith says he has a cure. Uh, and now Smith is very influential. Um, he has his cure. Uh, the British don't start it, try it out right away, but the French uh, read Smith and they, and they do try it out uh, 20 years later, during the, uh, 15 years later in the revolution. So here's his cure. 
So suppose you think of a small country that's on the gold standard. And it's got legal restrictions that prevent banks from issuing notes that are good substitutes for gold and silver in people's pockets. So, so you know, think of us today. So we're walking around uh, 1776, and we bring out a pound, and it doesn't look like this. It's heavier. It's gold or silver. That's it. Uh, so we're all carrying uh, lots of uh, gold and silver in our pockets, and, and that's the inefficiency. And Smith says, um, I can improve the allocation without causing any more inflation. So here's his scheme. Uh, this is right in book one. Here's his scheme. Um, I'm going to permit banks to um, issue note, these things, bank notes, except it's going to say, I, I don't know what yours says. Ours says, in God we trust. Um, but Smith's, note, Smith's notes are going to be issued by private notes, and they're going to say these are redeemable um, in gold on demand. But the bank's not going to hold gold. What the bank is going to do is it's going to um, hold safe evidences of private indebtedness. There's going to be private IOUs that are circulated, circulating. So what the bank's going to do, it's going to issue these things, and it's going to make loans, um, um, what Smith calls real bills. I'll tell you about that. And it's bound, so its balance sheet is going to have uh, just a little bit of gold on the asset side. Lots of these private IOUs, which are short-term self-liquidating loans. Its liability side is going to be these notes. And what Smith predicts is going to happen is these notes are going to be as good as gold. You're going to get an equilibrium where they're as good as gold. The gold is going to disappear from the country. And there's going to be a one-time import of goods, which are in util people's utility functions and you're just going to get a better allocation. And Smith recommends that. And he calls that, um, he calls that, uh, it's a version of free banking. So what Smith wants to do is he wants to remove the restriction on banks from intermediating evidences of private indebtedness. Now, what kinds of assets can the bank hold? He says, a real bill. And my uh, second grade, third grade teacher it was, told me not to define a real bill like this, but this is how Smith did it. So what a real bill is, Smith says, a bank discounts to a merchant a real bill of exchange drawn by a real creditor upon a real debtor and which as soon as it becomes due is really paid by that debtor. So what's Smith after there? Safe. Safe in short term. That's how I read him. Because he didn't know in first year Mac, he doesn't know what a random variable is. Um, but he's, but, he, but, he, but he, he, has, he, he wants these things to be risk-free and self-liquidating. Uh, so do you see the experiment? Um, so he's advocating free banking. Um, now this question, what is a re real bill? I'm going to come back to that. So, um, so, so this is the real bills doctrine. The real bills doctrine is if, if, a, um, if you permit free banking and you, and you uh, in banks, either by uh, government regulation or better just by this preservative apprehension of budget, um, hold safe portfolios, um, you're going to uh, eliminate this precautionary savings and increase the, um, you're going to increase the uh, efficiency. Now, do you understand why I say that's an essential part of Smith's attack on mercantilism? Because if the mer and, and by the way, if you want to read the best account that I've read on mercantilism, I've looked around, read Smith. And it's not a straw man. It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's not, he's not, doesn't create an account of mercantilism, which he's trying to make fun of later. Um, so, so he could, he's, he, this, this is an argument you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have price level stability. And um, this theory actually worked during the French Revolution. It's kind of tried twice. So there's two ways to implement the real bills doctrine. The first is um, free banking, what Smith said. But then there's another way. I think of today, and we'll come back to this. Um, suppose you don't permit free banking, but you have a central bank and a bunch of private banks that are restricted in their portfolios. So what you can have is the central bank do a, an open market operation. If the central bank freely discounts banks' holdings of, of uh, private securities and at an interest rate set, quote, 
with a view of accommodating commerce and business, then you'll, then you'll implement the same allocation that Smith had in mind. Where did I get the quote from? The Federal Reserve Board um, report of uh, 1923. So, so they viewed themselves as uh, implementing uh, Smith's procedure. So, um, so in the 19th century and into the 20th century, the real bills doctrine came to be regarded as promising that the money supply would regulate itself um, if central banks behave that way. And um, it was triumphant in many ways. So now we're going to turn the corner. However, um, the real bills doctrine was invented when we were on the gold standard. And then um, partly because people like Ricardo and Keynes were so influenced by Smith's argument, um, we went off the gold standard. That's a story for another day. And we went on a fiat money standard. So when, when we went on the fiat money standard, um, the, the notion that the real bills doctrine would regulate the money supply came in for criticism. And I, I want to talk about that criticism. So um, there's, a, there's a good book um, by uh, Liaquat Ahmed called The Lords of Finance, who mentions the real bills doctrine often. I recommend reading that book for entertainment. Uh, he mentions the real bills doctrine often, but only to insult it. He says you're a dope if you believe the real bills doctrine. Um, and um, he, got, he didn't invent that line. That line came from Chicago in the 30s where the real bills doctrine was transformed into the real bills fallacy. Um, so um, so it, it, was, it was, there's various versions of this argument that um, if you uh, use Smith's real bills doctrine, Smith got it wrong, and you're just going to get a lot of instability. So most, most of the analyses are hard to follow because they're in words. So I want to describe a model um, in which we can actually pit the real bills doctrine against the, um, we can pit the real bills doctrine and then run a contest against it um, versus uh, narrow banking, 100% reserves. So the Chicago plan is, don't let banks intermediate anything. If they issue a note, they got to hold gold or base money behind it. So they can't hold those real bills. So that's a recommendation that came out of, it's, it's, it, you can view Peel's Bank Act, it came out of Britain in the mid 19th century, and it was basically adopted by Chicago Wholesale in the 1930s. So, so I'm going to talk about a model that Neil Wallace and I fiddle around with in the, in the 80s to get at this question. So the purpose of this model is to, is to represent the ideas both of the critics of the real bills doctrine and the supporters of the real bill doctrine and um, see the virtues in both. And again, this is about drawing a line. It's a, it's a line that we're concerned about today. So, so here's this model. So, we take an overlapping generations model with some heterogeneity. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have time go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, on to infinity. Sorry about this, but you only live for two periods. Now, that's not essential, but it's sure convenient because it's very easy to compute the, the savings function. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some savers and some borrowers. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to make it pure endowment, just like Samuelson did. And, and if you're a saver, you're endowed a lot when you're young and little when you're old. So you want to lend. If you're a borrower, you're like our former president, Ronald Reagan. You're endowed with nothing when you're young, and you hit it big when you're old. So, so what you want to do is you want to borrow to smooth. So there's, these guys are going to be together. And then, and then we're going we're gonna to follow the master Samuelson. We're going to rig this economy um, so it's actually um, short of borrowers. Short of borrowers. There are not enough borrowers. And, and that, means that, um, that means the interest rate is going to be too low unless the government steps in and issues some fiat money. So we're going to do that. We're going we're gonna to 
just like Samuelson, we're going to adopt this overlapping generations framework so that we can, we can have a role for, for, for fiat money. We're going to do that, but we're going to, we're going to also have borrowers and lenders. Um, Samuelson, by the way, only had lenders. But we want borrowers and lenders. So, so now here's the deal. Um, I'm going to have some rich borrowers and lenders, so I'm thinking Brazil, and some poor lenders. So I'm thinking about the Real plan in the, in the 80s. So there's going to be some poor guys who are, they can only, they can only hold, they can't hold hedge funds. Or they can't hold uh, lots of things issued by banks. They can just hold. They can hold small denomination notes. So these are the natural money holders. But then I'm going to have some rich guys who are. They got big endowments. I'm going to have some rich borrowers and some rich lenders. That's kind of the setting. So there's rich borrowers, rich lenders, and there's poor lenders, and there's this fiat money. So the liabilities in this thing, fiat money, that's the, I, the government's printing up this stuff, and the magic of Samuelson is it gets valued um, just because the economy is short of borrowers. Okay, so that's kind of the setting. And then um, this economy is going to kick out a price level. It's going to kick out a value of this stuff, which is going to depend on how all the endowments are arranged. That's it. So this is the economy. So now, so now I want to talk about Smith. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with Smith's uh, setting where the money market is segregated from the, from the borrowing and lending market. So there's some borrowers and, and lenders, and they're interacting in the borrowing and lending market. And I'm going to generate fluctuations in the demand for credit by moving the endowments of the, um, the borrowers around. So I'm going to generate some fluctuating interest rates in the demand for credit. I'm going to rig it so the interest rates are high. So the creditors are paying high, high real interest rates. See with me? Can you, can you see the economy? So the, there's these large denomination IOUs, which are being traded by the big guys. Banks can, cannot intermediate this stuff because there's a law against it. There's a mercantilist law. And then the government has issued this fiat money, and the poor guys hold it. So in this equilibrium, the money market's separated from the credit market. Interest rates are fluctuating over time because the demand for credit is fluctuating. Price level is stable because there's nothing the supply and the demand for money is just the same. Price level is constant. The real rate of return on money is zero, and the real rates of return on this other stuff is positive and fluctuating. That's it. So we do a little first-year analysis on this, and this equilibrium is not Pareto optimal. It's got a constant price level. So why is it not Pareto optimal? It's because different people are facing different rates of return. There's a rate of return wedge at all times. And that means there's what Milton Friedman called inefficiencies, rate of return wedge, and incentives for avoidance. Um, there's an arbitrage in this economy. Um, if a bank were allowed to enter, it could issue money that was backed by these private IOUs, it could pay this rate of return of one and pocket the difference. If there were free entry into banking or free banking, this rate of return dominance would be knocked out. And what would happen is the, um, all the rates of return would change, and everybody would get the same rate of return. So what free banking will do is it will, or real bills, it will eliminate this rate of return discrepancy, and you'll get to an equilibrium Okay, this can be a mouthful, which is Pareto optimal. No rate of return discrepancies. But what will now happen is the instability that was in the credit market is going to be trans transmitted to the money market, and the price level is going to be fluctuating. Um, it's got to fluctuate to give real rate of return um, uh, differences over time. So, the, so money is going to be a, a great asset with real, with real bills. It's going to be as good as these private IOUs. So the, f what free banking is going to do is it's going to um, alter the allocation. It's going to alter the interest rates. It's going to give something that's Pareto optimal, 
but not Pareto dominating the other equilibrium. There's going to be winners and losers. Some guys are going to like, it's going to be a complicated pattern of winners and losers. So that's the story. So this is, this is the model Neil and I uh, wrote down to say, OK, um, does it represent, um, it's both pro-real bills and anti-real bills. On the Pareto criterion, just like Smith said, it's, um, you get efficiency by knocking down this line, but you get instability in the money market. Now this analysis, I'm going to, a, a sub-theme here is what's a real bill, what's a real bill? I had lunch with a famous uh, central banker recently, and he told me, swearing, that's not a real bill, meaning some of the stuff that's on the Fed balance sheet. Um, we'll come back to that. But this experiment is, there's no risk in here. Okay, so, um, so that's it. So, so, so this, this little model is going to be my tool for representing the, um, the tension between real bills, which eliminates the inefficiency by creating winners and losers, eliminates the wedge, um, but it unleashes some in instability. It's period optimal, but it's still unstable. So um, what narrow banking does is if you come into an economy where you ins see the instability, you can cure it by separating the money, uh, markets for money and credit. Um, so that's it. So there's winners and losers. I've told you that. Um, and hate to tell you, in real life policies, there are winners and losers. Any, anytime uh, you, you push an interest rate up or down or you create a wedge, you are not going to make all people happy. So it's going to be politics as usual. Um, there's a sunspot version of this story, so I want to go on. Okay, um, so I've told you this. Narrow banking stabilizes monetary aggregates in the price level. Everything I've said about the price level is also true about the, pr the, the money supply. The reason real bills um, creates this instability is that the monetary aggregate, it's now got this inside money component controlled by the government. It's got this, I'm sorry, outside money component controlled by the government and inside money which the government's lost control of because of the fluctuating credit. That's the story. Okay, now Milton Friedman in his program for monetary stability, um, which, okay, so remember I said, um, Famous economists have been on both sides of, these, uh, of this tension. Maybe they've almost flipped. So Milton Friedman, in, a, in his famous program for monetary stability, he starts from the Chicago plan of banking reform, but he says he's going to um, repair it because he sees that there are these rate of return wedges with these inefficiencies and incentives for avoidance. When you see those rate of return wedges, that's what those guys, which way is Lombard Street from here? That way? That way. That's what those greedy blankety blanks are doing. They're seeing those rate of return wedges and they're um, exploiting them. Those are the incentives, the incentives for avoidance. That goes with the territory. So what Milton Friedman wants to do is eliminate those. So what he's going to do is he's going to um, pay interest on reserves. Now, if you, in the United States, this is a big deal interest on reserves at the market rate of interest. And what he says is this is going to uh, eliminate the um, inefficiency. He's going to amend the Chicago plan of banking reform, which was this narrow banking. So what we're going to see is, oh, well, you, you can see right away is this is equivalent to his famous optimum quantity um, of money recommendation, which comes through in lots of models. But when Friedman announces this, he hesitates. He says he was almost persuaded by a, a, a kid, Gary Becker's student paper, recommending a move in the opposite direction. That was just free banking. Just can the whole, just go from the second, the first thing with the line to the second thing, go Adam Smith. He said he, he was almost going to do that. It was, and he's called it a move in the opposite direction. Um, well, so is it a move in the opposite direction? Now, Friedman. Even though he, he worked only in words, so if you're like, if you're like I am, I have trouble reading a, a paper that's all in words. Actually, I prefer no words, just the equations. Um, but Friedman doesn't have, he only has words. But, but the guy's cheating. 
because in his back room, he's got a general equilibrium model. He's just not showing it to you. So what Friedman says is, oh, by the way, you can't just recommend paying interest on reserves. You've got to say how you're going to finance it. Now, remember that third line. Uh, last time I looked, central banks uh, didn't have the authority to issue to raise taxes. Uh, but I should look more closely. So what he said is um, there's two ways that you can pay the interest on reserves. One, and he says it matters. It's not a detail. One is you can use earnings from the central bank's portfolio because it's going to be buying stuff. And the other is you can levy taxes. And I'll tell you what happens here. So let's put those, if you put these into a model, here's what it turns out. If you use earnings on a government portfolio to finance the interest on payments, the interest on reserves, do the analysis. It turns out it's just real bills through the back door. It's just equivalent with Gary Becker's procedure. And if you kind of, if you, if you kind of think of it, it's, um, it's a real bills operation. Um, so when you do that, a freedom goes from one pole um, the thing with a line, and he goes all the way. You notice I put him on the far right. Uh, he, it, it, um, it eradicates the Chicago plan completely. Um, things essentially get worse and more complicated if you finance by taxes, as we are in the United States, because what it does is it, leash, it un unleashes the horror of all horrors. It unleashes un indeterminacy. It makes, it makes the uh, price level indeterminate, taxes indeterminate, and so on. So um, it matters how you finance it. Um, the purpose of the proposal is to remove the, the wedge, but when you do that, um, you gotta have some resources to, to remove the wedge, and depending on how you do it, um, it's a highly technical, but uh, it, it matters a lot. And this, this is all just coming from manipulating budget constraints. So um, that's what I wanna say. So there's an old line of excelling indeterminacy is an attack on the, um, on the real bills doctrine. The true situation is indeterminacy is really an attack on the um, Chicago plan supplemented by paying interest on reserves. So we're paying interest on reserves in the United States, and there's a lot of under the table or um, uh, scary conversation about exactly how the Fed's going to finance that because it's, it's uh, grabbing fiscal policies. So just make a few cheap remarks here. Paying interest on reserves financed by tax payments is fiscal policy. So congressmen and others who are concerned about that, they ought to be. So this is just one more illustration how this sequence of government budget constraints makes the independent of the Fed a, a fiction. Uh, maybe it's a useful fiction. And I just want to mention um, how Milton Friedman changed his mind on something, something else. So how are you going to coordinate monetary and fiscal policy? That issue is always, always with us. So I'm going to tell you what Friedman said in 49 and in 1960. And don't, don't look at the slide. Here's what he said in 49. Here's how you should coordinate monetary and fiscal policy. The fiscal authority issues bonds. The monetary authority should buy 100% of them. So think of the ECB. Greece issues bonds, buy them. OK? Um, 100%. Um, that's it. And he also recommended that the government balance its budget over the business cycle. Um, but, you know, this coordination mechanism, if you're going issue, issue, to issue debt, it's going to be monetized. When? Right now. And then in 1960, he changed his mind. And he said, no, what the Fed's going to do is it's going um, to increase the monetary base K percent a year, where K is a small number. So if you, if you borrow, if you're the government and you borrow, don't come to us. We'll give you K percent, but it's nothing. Uh, if you're Greece, don't go, you know, go to the markets. So why did he do those? Those are two alternative, really clean ways of coordinating monetary and fiscal policy. Why did he switch? Um, well, he's struggling to find a, a, a way for a responsible monetary story to to get the upper hand over the fiscal authorities in, in, in what you can think of as a game of chicken between the monetary and fiscal authorities. They gotta coordinate. It's a kind of question who goes first and, um, and um, so far in terms of game theory, we're in way over our head in thinking about this. Friedman recognized that. So another Friedman proposal you may have heard of. 
He was for a balanced budget. A bunch of American conservatives were, were for a balanced budget mo uh, amendment in the, in the 80s, uh, in the 70s. They dropped it in the 80s, and you'll never hear him mention it now. Why? Okay, so now I'm going to come back to the final thing. Um, another line. Now, what is a real bill? So, so you see Smith tr struggling with it. And what's risk-free? So the question is, and, and what's a wedge? So should banks, and, and think of Edgeworth and the mathematical theory of banking, should banks and other intermediaries be allowed to improve efficiency by offering products that rely on statistical averaging, Edgeworth, and censoring to transform bundles of risky assets, idiosyncratic risk, of various durations into much less risky assets that can be used to back short-term liabilities. So can you create some stuff that's pretty risk-free out of some stuff that's risky? If you can, it's welfare improving. Should you let them do it? That's, that's the question that we have now. Okay. Um, so should, should and, and, and do those qualify as a modern version of real bills? And where should you draw the line? Um, so what, what this question does is it, it, this set of issues raises questions about proper policy toward public lenders of last resort, which Badgett said in an ideal world we shouldn't have, but in the world we have we should, and suppliers of deposit insurance, which, which Friedman and Tobin, my teachers through reading, those, that's one of the things they both thought was a good idea. So I want to talk about the, the final line. Um, which is connected to these other lines, um, federal bailouts and deposit insurance. And this is what Volcker is all about in uh, what, what we should be, th what we are thinking about. So there's going to be a stability versus efficiency issue. So think about complete markets versus incomplete markets, wedges and not. And now I'm, I'm going to conclude with um, a pal of Paul Volcker's uh, put his finger on, on what the real problem is. And it's it's not the incentives of the greedy bankers. They're going to behave, Paul Volcker thinks they're going to behave just like greedy bankers. But it's incentives of the, of the policymakers uh, to protect bank creditors. So I'm going to tell you two models, two modern models. These are first class models of deposit insurance. Um, they're both rational expectations models. Um, every model I've talked about is a rational expectations model. Um, where people are exploiting arbitrage opportunities and, and seeing through balance sheets. So the first is a model, the, the famous Diamond Divig model, where deposit insurance is good. I'll tell you why it's good in that model. I'll tell you a model of Carrick and Wallace, where deposit insurance is bad. And then these models are going to show you the tension. Um, and deposit insurance is all about erasing a line between central banks and treasuries and private banks. Should you do it? And is it going to cost you anything? I got a great quote from, from Walter Badgett, which I recommend you read in the summer. So he's on both sides of this. I just got my quote quotes. So let me tell you about Diamond Divig. So I'll tell you about the environment. This is going to be an environment where there's a role for a, uh, um, an insurance supplying maturity transforming institution. So, so here's this set. It's a very simple model. There's going to be um, some, some good investment that's long term. You've got to leave it in for two periods. Um, there's no one person or, um, that's big enough to, um, to leave it in for two periods. So if you leave people on their own, they just won't undertake the investment. And there's a source of um, liquidity shocks. People, when they're born, they don't know whether they want to consume early or late. Um, so so uh, there's a Pareto optimal, the Pareto optimal allocation that involves risk sharing and maturity transformation. You undertake these long-term investments, and you, um, you insure people against their, against their type. So you pool risks. Um, now. Can you support that with a competitive equilibrium? Well, it's a long story and a big literature, but here's what Diamond Divig did, and they were shrewd. 
they put a restriction on the class of, depo uh, of, of uh, ins insurance, co of deposit insurance. I'm sorry, deposit contracts. They made a mimic the one that we have with, um, I, I hate to say this, Citibank, my bank. First come, first serve. And then they, they studied uh, Nash equilibria. And what there are is uh, there's multiple Nash equilibria. There's one that's great. Um, you get a Pareto optimal allocation. You get the optimal amount of insurance. It's a no runs equilibrium where I leave my money in unless I need it early. I get it out. You leave it in because you don't need it. Unfortunately, there's zillions of other equilibria that are runs equilibria, which is this. Um, we put our money in the bank. Um, you don't need it early, but you see um, him uh, going, and you think he doesn't need it either, but he's running because he thinks um, you're going to run. Um, and then what, what happens then is the whole thing collapses. Um, there's a run in equilibrium. Um, there's not insurance. There's not maturity transformation. We don't put the money in the bank. It's just, just a bad allocation. Um, so what happens with deposit insurance? This is, so this is too good to be true. Government supplied deposit insurance. Um, what the government says is um, people start running, we, we guarantee them. And then what happens is on that selects a unique equilibrium via promises of what you're going to do off the equilibrium path. I'll come back to that. So what it does is on the equilibrium path, deposit insurance is costless. It just knocks off the bad equilibrium. Okay, so go back uh, a little more than a year, and now think uh, United States, and you're a central bank uh, official, and here's what you see. You know um, there's deposit insurance in the United States, FDIC, that's, that satisfies some institutions. By the way, what is a bank, B-A-N-K? Um, so in the diamond Divig model, it's not something that has B-A-N-K written on it. It's a maturity transforming institution. It's a maturity transforming, risk transforming institution. So um, you look out the window in uh, fall of 2008, you know deposit insurance is in place and it should prevent runs, that's what the theory is. So I'm a true believer in the diamond Divig model. I, I see that and I, um, I start seeing incipient runs on institutions that are not, uh, they look like diamond divvig banks, but they don't have deposit insurance. They're money market mutual funds, they're shadow banks, they're hedge funds, and um, I see a run happening, and then I say, the problem is we don't have enough deposit insurance, and what I do is I step in optimistically, and I uh, de facto ex post deposit insurance them. And then what is my hope is if I, if I believe the Diamond Divig model, that's going to knock out the bad equilibrium and it is not going to cost anything. Um, don't worry, it's not going to cost anything because we're just, uh, we're buying good stuff. So this is very optimistic and I think um, three quarters to 90%, this is what the authorities had in mind and it's an optimistic view. Um, so if you read Diamond Divig, I'll come to the last thing I want to say. You read Diamond Divig, um, their paper um, talks about this, talks about the virtues of deposit insurance, and then it has a caveat. I always read the last section of papers. It has a caveat. It says, uh, oh, we left something out um, that we think might be important, uh, moral hazard. And it says um, that could change things. And to see how it could change things, go read a 1978 paper by my former colleague and friend, Neil Wallace and John Carrigan, in the uh, journal, uh, Chicago Journal of Business. Um, so let me tell you about that thing. This is a model where deposit insurance is bad. And this is what keeps Gary Stern and Paul Volcker up at night. And ought to keep, you're a taxpayer, ought to take you up at night. So here's, here's the deal. Complete markets. So this is first year macro. Complete markets. We're going to do things twice. This is a Badgett model, Badgett natural model. Experiment one, no deposit insurance. Um, intermediaries can form if they want, free entry. There's a bunch of guys who want to hold safe liabilities, notes. If you want to hold them, um, 
You're going to go to a bank that holds a safe vector of uh, assets. It takes no risk. With no deposit insurance, um, this is Badgett's preservative apprehension. Depositors and other creditors have incentives to monitor the bank and make sure that it's, they look at its portfolio. That's experiment one. Um, with deposit insurance, just rework it. We're going to have deposit insurance um, uh, for depositors and maybe other creditors. Read in Fed We Trust and see what um, some of our um, important authorities say. It's really important to insure the creditors, not just the depositors. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to insure depositors. Um, and now we're just going to re rework the bank shareholders uh, problem. So with complete markets and deposit insurance, it's, incentive, it's in the incentive of the bank shareholders to make the bank as big as possible and as risky as possible. And with deposit insurance and not regulation on the bank portfolio, you will get banks big and risky. And with probability one, they will fail. And this will cost the taxpayer and the government money. So this is a thing where deposit insurance, um, if, if, you reg if you have deposit insurance, you have to regulate. Um, so th this paper was written by, by Carrickin and Wallace. Carrickin wrote another paper called the horse before the cart, and the horse is deregulation, and the cart is uh, you better uh, fix deposit insurance if you deregulate. But that wasn't done. So these two models have the tension. Um, and um, so where, where should you draw the line? Um, so there's, a, there's a, a good book by Gary Stern called Too Big to Fail. He was the president of the Minneapolis Fed and a friend of Paul Volcker's. Paul Volcker wrote the introduction. This book was written in 2004, so you can't say rational expectations macroeconomists didn't, didn't warn you. If you didn't get the message from Carrick and Wallace. Um, so, um, oh, another thing is, I hear this in America all the time. Oh, there's no moral hazard problem because the shareholders took losses from, from these banks. Go read Carrick and Wallace. The shareholders do take losses in their model. It's the creditors who have to take losses to cure it. So when you bail out the creditors, that's when you're creating the problem. Um, so there's a lot of missed uh, stuff that, that um, you could just get from that model. So the, um, okay. So, 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 so I think the true state of affairs is there are some benefits to preventing runs, but they have big costs in terms of provoking, de 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 provoking moral hazard. Um, and now, how do you fix that? So if you're a mechanism design person, I just recommend those things. The key problem is the ex post incentive that public officials have to bail banks out. And how, how are you going to fix that? So that's the, that is the public policy uh, question of today, just like it was in 1776 and 1844. Um, so I want to say what Paul Volcker said. So Paul Volcker um, has some recent words. He was not talking, the, it's too bad he was not talking um, to the president, or the president wasn't talking to him before about a month ago. Um, so. Read these words, which uh, this is from a New York Times article. He says, the long-established safety net undergirding the stability of commercial banks, deposit insurance, and lender of last resort facilities has been both reinforced and extended in a series of ad hoc decisions to support investment banks, mortgage providers, and the world's largest insurance company. In the process, managements, creditors, and to some extent, stockholders of these banks have been protected. Carrick and Wallace. And then he says, as things stand, the consequence will be to enhance incentives to risk-taking and leverage with the implication of an even more fragile financial system. It would be a shame if this is what uh, my generation hands off to your generation.
yeah, yeah. <coughs> Uh, banks and other financial institutions, central banks and treasury and so on. Uh, you have also pointed out at the beginning that the politicians, uh, policy makers have vacillated and changed their mind about these things. What is your sense about the narration of causation uh, of these vacillations? It's, it's been the politicians uh, responding to uh, economists changing their minds and, and changing their mind themselves, or economists responding to changes in policy or, or both being driven by, by some third fact which is probably called reality and, uh, and induce both to change, change their views occasionally. So I guess the answer is I don't know. The honest answer is I don't know. I think, I think the um, so when you start writing down models of this, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a time consistency <coughs> problem there. So the, the time consistency problem of the things that, and that's essential to it. The time consistency problem is about the temptation to change your mind, um, in some sense, or conflict. It's about conflict, intertemporal conflict. So there's things that are ex ante that, are, that you want to promise to promote the right behavior, and then ex post you, um, you're not going to do, you know. So, 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 so here's what here's. I'll, I'll just give you an example where this comes up. And there's there's kind of. So I didn't like this when it was happened, but so so Mervyn King. Um, um, in the fall of uh, 2007, um, shortly before Northern Rock failed, he he wrote a a wonderful, I think it was a letter to a member of Parliament. Um, raising the moral hazard question um, about the adverse incentive effects that happened when, you, um, when banks had the expectation that you were going to protect them. And then Northern Rock happened, and then Larry Summers wrote in a column in the New York Times, and in, in the Financial Times. And what Larry said was, um, well, now when we have an incipient panic is not the time for the moral hazard police to come out. Um, so, um, so in a way, it's both a... It's both a, so who's right and who's wrong? It's kind of a cheap shot, but he chose his time. So it poses a nine, so, so what you can say is, yeah, that's the ex post incentive to cave, but if that's not the time for him to come out, when is the time for him to come out? And that's, that's a tension. Time consistency problem just isn't something in a book. It's like, it's with us. And, th and that's what, that's what, um, that's what guys like, uh, That's what uh, Volcker's struggling with. He wants to, he wants to create institutions that, uh, that change the incentives ex post so that you get um, good incentives ex ante. And in terms of the interaction between politicians and economists, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. And, uh, um, Time for a question from the audience? There. You started to talk about, um, or started out by talking about um, self-liquidating real bills, and um, then someone made the transition to uh, mortgage-backed securities. Um, up until two years ago, we all thought that mortgage-backed securities would be self-liquidating, but something seems to have gone wrong in the process. Now, there could be policy implications which would e either go down the free banking route or the mechanism design route. So what's your stance on this? So let me make sure I understand the question, because I think, so, you, you're juxtaposing the mechanism design route versus the free banking route. Sorry about that. I didn't express myself clearly. Um, the question is essentially what, what's going wrong with, or what has gone wrong with the mortgage-backed securities? Um, at some point, you, uh, you had this nice chart where you said um, in the 19th century, it was real bulls. In the 20th century, 
it was sovereign debt in, in the 21st century, it was mortgage-backed securities that, um, uh, that provided the bridge between the credit market and the, uh, and the money market. And I'm kind of trying to further develop your analogy where you, by which you said, um, Adam Smith said that uh, renewables are a wonderful thing because they are self-liquidating. Yeah. And my question is essentially, didn't we think exactly the same thing about mortgage-backed securities? Yeah, so and what is it that went wrong? And then the next uh, question would be, uh, if you want to fix what apparently went wrong with mortgage-backed securities, is, um, is there scope for regulation? Should that be regulated? Yeah. Should that not be regulated? Okay, so I'll put my, tar my, my, um, my cards on the table. I'm, I'm pro-regulation, big time. Um, and drawing lines, and then, um, and I mean, I mean, and basically, um, I mean, the, it's it's kind of the tail wagging the dog. If you're going to have de uh, deposit insurance, which it seems that we're going to have, this is this is how I take it: Volcker's logic or the logic of these models. If you're going to have public resources uh, devoted to uh, bailing out some institutions, you have a public interest in in regulating them and making their portfolio safe. So forget mortgage-backed securities, which are a good, in principle, they, they, they can be a good idea. And they were oversold. But um, so, so you, I mean, I mean, the idea is to, to, to have a class of institutions which have access to deposit insurance, and you make them safes to protect the taxpayer. Um, and then you have another class of institutions so, that are, are risky, and they're cut off from the taxpayer. And, um, and um, I guess if mechanism design, I, I suspect if mechanism design doesn't produce that, it probably doesn't have the specification of the economy right now. But that's, a, that's all just a guess. Um, you know, the other proposal is just, just don't have deposit insurance. And just let people trade, and then and let let you guys who hold money in banks just realize you're going to get risky rate of return, and start start looking at the um, stuff that the being horrified at the stuff that their banks are holding, and then go to banks that are just do that on your own, um, and forget deposit insurance. That was what Badgett said. Um, Francesco's question is still bothering me. Um, I'm going to have trouble sleeping tonight. There's time for dinner. Other questions? Can I say one more thing? Yeah. His question bothered Badgett. So what Badgett says is the following. And so he can write in beautiful English. So he says the following. What you want to do is you want to make banks think that they're on your own and you're not going to bail them out. But then when they get in trouble, at a certain point, bail them out with all the resources you have. And he says, uh, this may not work. <coughs> uh, guess why? Uh, you, you made a, a great case, um, both here and in your past work, that the uh, monetary and fiscal um, separation is a myth. Um, and it sounded from your presentation that you feel there's no solution to that. Uh, uh, inherent uh, uh, game. Do you, do you, uh, do you uh, could you maybe elaborate on what you think might be possible, um, uh, possible institutional arrangements that could um, alleviate that problem? So, okay, so, not that, so it's, so there's some good work on this, um, which, which, where, which people try to formalize, like, um, like Bassetto and Coat and the Bag Bataglini, where they actually try to try to write down, you know, um, particular games. Now to get anywhere, they have to strip off. They're they're really um, abstract models. They're stripping off a lot of things that you and I think are important. Um, so they're leaving out some really important stuff. So like I've heard things like. I've heard cases of where there's been, I don't know. So, so I think progress on that front has been slow, just because the games are so complicated. You know, game theory, is, game theory is great in principle, but almost every interesting game, I showed it David Krebs and he can't solve it. He says it's too complicated. 
give me something simpler. So, the, so, the, so in macro, things are complicated, and there are lots of things. Like in the United States, we got we have 50 governments. We got a we have 99 legislatures. I think one, you know, state legislatures and governors, and and we have 50. I mean, just the gamesmanship that's being played. Um, um, so. So making progress on it, that I think is important. I think like kind of an, there's been some heroes. There's been some monetary authorities who've been just like there was one in Mexico who just said, I am not going to monetize and um, over my dead body. And he made it stick for a while. A guy like that was just replaced, by the way. So I, I don't know. We have time for one last question. But before I uh, let the question be asked, I want to remind you there is a reception just following this uh, uh, lecture on the senior common room, uh, which is on the uh, fifth floor of this building. The last question back there. Yeah, I was captivated by Badgett and um, his solution. But it seems to me that there are enormous um, information asymmetries which prevent us from um, actually putting into effect our apprehension. We do not know how apprehensive we should be. Um, regulation, which is the alternative, and I'm not, I, I, I rather suspect that you're going down that road partly for this reason, but the information asymmetry remains. Um, it's merely transferred to the regulator from the um, consumer. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. First, in the United States, we're not. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going. We're going down late regulation light. Um, um, and I, so, so a good so person mentioned mechanisms. A, a good, the whole thing with mechanisms. You're gonna you're gonna design it to respect the. Um, to, you know, there's some things you don't need much information about. Whole treasury bills. As you know, I I can check that. Um, Although, um, watch what we do with treasury bills. But, uh, okay. And with that, thank Tom Thorogen for a great evening, and uh, hope to see you all up upstairs for the reception. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.